بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First and foremost, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me this opportunity to be present before you this evening to deliver a talk wherein I hope and I pray that it will be a benefit for myself and it will, it will be a benefit for yourself also, bi'ithnillah ta'ala. It's strange and peculiar because normally the masjid during the month of Ramadan at this time is filled with believers. In our own masjid, you know, there's only two of us praying salah and it feels weird, it feels ajeeb, like there's nobody there. Normally the masjid is filled. In our masjid, because we have a small masjid, it's filled during Maghrib and people sometimes have to be turned away. That's how filled our masjid is. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Habibi Allah ta'ala gives us masjid that we can fill also. So this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and many ulama have also mentioned that there are hidden blessings in these difficult times as well. Right, so while we are connected to the masjid, rightly so, and the sign of a believer is also that he loves the masjid, that they love the masjid, that they want to be connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the masjid, it's also a testing time for all of us. <clears throat> so today's topic, inshallah, I'm going to talk about valuing time. What does it mean to do qadr, to take one's time seriously? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the concept of time in the Quran many many times he might not mention it by name but he alludes towards it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes ishara towards the importance of time and the qadr of time as well one of the most important surahs in the Quran of course they're all important but one of them that's important it's very short in the Quran is wal as wal as innal insan lafi khus that by the declining day, by the declining of the day, ulama say this is the time of Asr, as the day comes to an end, like now. Right? The day is coming to an end, as, as in the daylight is coming to a close. Inna al-insana lafi khus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that all of mankind is in deep loss. They're in nuqsan. Right? So Allah uses day, daylight and he says, and he juxtaposes this with loss. That your life is coming to an end. Right? The human era, civilization is coming to an end. We know now that we are moving closer to the Day of Judgment. Right? There's no new prophet to come. The Quran is the final revelation that has been sent to humankind. There's no new Quran to come. There's no new prophet to come to this world. It's finished. That's it now. All we are waiting for is the end of time. So Asr is also signifying this end of human civilization. We don't know how long the earth has been here. Millions, billions of years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it's all going to come to an end. So we're reaching the end of human existence or the, the existence of the universe. We know, for example, a sun that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed for us has been here for billions of years, billions and billions of years. We don't know exactly how long and neither is that important. But it is by the sun, by our movement, the planet moving around the sun that we know time. Huh? What, how do we work out sunrise? We look at when the sun rises. Eh? How do we work out sunset? How do we work out zawal? How do we work out time? We look at the moon. We look at the movement on the, of the moon and the sun. These two objects Allah has placed around us. Through it we know time. And remember, as an aqidah point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not bound by time. For Allah, there's no past. For Allah, there's no future. For Allah, there's no present. Allah creates time. Khalik, that's what makes him the Khalik. This is why a lot of young people, they come to me and say, Marana, you know, we have an issue with the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah knows everything already, if Allah knows everything already, then what's the point of being tested? But you don't know. Allah, what makes Allah is the fact that He knows. If Allah didn't know what was going to happen in your life, then I would no longer make Him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly what's going to happen, Right? Doesn't mean that you don't need to do anything. You still have to make effort. You still have to make mujahada. Because Allah creates time. Allah creates space. Right? Me and you can only be in one place at one time. I'm only in Masjid Bilal today. I cannot be in any other masjid. This is my human weakness. But Allah is everywhere. Laysa kamithlihi shay. Yet nothing is Allah subhanahu like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah mentions himself in the Quran. So Allah creates time and time exists. 
because we look at the moon, we look at the sun, and we look at the moon. If you were looking at it last night, it's reaching, it's coming close to half moon now. You see, mashallah, you can see it, right? This is Allah's creation, it's telling you the months. And in pre modern times, before we had uh, GPS, if you were lost in the ocean, if you were in the ocean on a ship, right, how would you know where to go? Because when you're in the ocean, Dariyame, everything looks the same to you. So what they would do, they would, put, they would create, the Muslims invented the astrolabe. There was this instrument that they would point out to the sky and they would use the stars and they would tell them exactly where they needed to go. Subhanallah. Right? Through the stars. That's why the Sahaba are like stars because you guide yourself through them. You guide yourself by following them. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the stars. So nothing Allah has created is wasted. And when you look at the stars, even the farmers, they would know by looking at the stars what season it is. When to plant things, when to reap their harvest, by looking at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by looking at the movement of the stars, by looking at the sun, all of these things signal time. Allah created these things. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create the sun, if Allah ta'ala didn't create the moon, if Allah ta'ala didn't create the stars, we wouldn't have a concept of time. By, by the fact that Allah has created these things, we come to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, because of technology today, we don't really appreciate the makhluk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like our forefathers did when they were living back home in Pakistan or India or Bangladesh because they had connection with nature. They saw the makhluk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To give you another example before I move into my talk, death, maut. Maut today is a very distant thing to us. Right? You King Mawlisa is talking very falasafa, falasafa, they say back that day. But if you didn't understand this death, a few generations ago, you would grow your own, you would look after your own animals. Your sheep, your chicken, your cows, you would look after it yourself. You would feed it, you would, you would take care of it. And then eventually you would make qurbani of it. You, eventually you would kill it yourself. You would see your own uncles and aunties die in front of you. And you would see death all the time. Animals dying, people dying. You would see uh, plants dying and coming back to life again because you lived in nature. Our forefathers, they lived in the countryside. And they cultivated plants and animals and trees and so forth, right? They grew these things. So they, they recognize Allah through this. But now because we don't really grow stuff anymore, we buy it all from the supermarket. Even the chicken that we buy, right? It's just ready made for us. We just have to cook it. So we don't have this feeling of death anymore. Even in, in, in outside communities, when their parents die, what do they do? Or when they, when they become old, what do they do? They put them in old people's home. And when they die, phone out of hey, your mom and dad, or your mom's died, your mom's died, father's died. Okay, can I have inheritance now? And so death is not anything, something that's real for us. And this is what's happened in a modern world. We've lost connection. Now we're all using laptops and we're all using phones and technology, right? This has changed the world. So this is wal asr. Inna li insala fi khus. The man is in complete loss. Time is ticking away. Tick, 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 tick. If you've got to watch that tick ticks, you'll notice this. Every second of your life is gone. You'll never get a life back. You'll never get a second back. You'll never get a minute back. You'll never get a day back. That you're in a state of loss. Allah says, what? Except, this is what's called uh, istithna. Right? Except the people who believe. That person who has iman, they're not in a state of loss. They're not in a state of loss because their iman will benefit them in the akhirah. But that is not enough. That that person who has Iman and they perform righteous acts. It's not enough just to stay in the masjid or just sit at home and say, Oh, I've got Iman now and I don't need to do anything else. No, Amal is Salih to perform righteous actions as well. So a person when he has Iman and a person when he and she has uh, Amal is Salih, they're performing righteous actions, then inshallah this will benefit them. And Allah says, number three, وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالْحَقِّ That they urge one another, they help one another, they assist one another to bring taqwiya, to bring strength towards the truth. So, can you see how beautiful it is? Iman is in the heart. Amal is with the body parts. بِالْجَوَارِ As the ulama say. بِالْجَوَارِ And then, وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالْحَقِّ is the community. Can you see how it moves from the heart to yourself, to your body, and then to helping one another. So, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّمْ And they also help one another in patience, in being steadfast to the deed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Difficult times for us, difficult time for the ummah. 
but they support one another. They strengthen one another. They give tasbeet and to one another. They give strength to one another. So these people who have these four sifat, right? Iman, Amal, Salih, and they have patience and they help one another. Allah says in the Quran, and Allah never lies. Billahi min zalik. Allah speaks the truth. Allah says they are the people who are not in loss, but the rest of humankind is in loss. And most of humankind, Allah says, most of humankind do not recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has given us this gift of Iman. But is that enough? Of course, we need to do more. Now, in terms of the ni'mat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us, Allah has given us so many blessings that we cannot count them. They are infinity. وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا Allah says if you try and count the ni'mat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will never be able to count them. Just looking, just sitting here. Just sitting here and you're listening to me, I'm listening to you. In your body, all the functions that are going on, the blinking of your eyes, the windscreen wipers, right? The heart pumping, right? The vessels, the blood going on around your body, your organs, your intestines, your stomach, which is going to be busy in about an hour from now, right? All of these things. The fact that you can see the light that you're using, the retina and all of this, that, that, that you can hear. All of these things Allah is keeping functioning. All of this within you, within you. That, I'm not even talking about anything else. That you're able to breathe, coronavirus, right? We know what happens with coronavirus. One of the symptoms is what? That you find it difficult to breathe. Huh? So this is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا If you look within yourself and you begin to count them, Allah says you won't, you won't be able to count them. And then you look around you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so much wealth, so many blessings. They can be categorized into two, two types. One is a primary uh, benefit and the other thing is a secondary benefit. So a secondary benefit is things like money. Allah gives you wealth, that's a benefit. That's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives you a strong physical body, that's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be able to perform the nawafil is also a secondary benefit from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be able to clean yourself, to be able to look after yourself is also a secondary benefit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and it goes on, the list goes on. And there are primary benefits. Okay, These are also infinite. Primary benefits is the most important one is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest benefit, the greatest gift that Allah has given me and you, the greatest gift is Iman. Without a shadow of doubt, the greatest gift Allah has given to you, whether you're a poor person, whether you're a wealthy person, whatever race you are, if you have Iman, you are in reality the richest person because you will see the wealth of Iman. No, never mind when you die, the moment you start dying. The moment, the moment life ends, your ruh begins to leave your body and ulama tell us that once the ruh reaches the throat, once the ruh reaches the throat, you're able to see the malaika. You're able to see the akhirah. You're leaving this world and you'll see the benefit of Iman because inshallah, the malaika that will come and get you, you to take your soul out, you realize by them, by looking at them, that alhamdulillah, you know, I'm going with Iman, inshallah. Allah gives us all death with Iman. Right? Allah gives us all death with Iman and we have to work for it. So this is the greatest blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us Iman. Then he has given us the ability to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah has given us a healthy body. Yeah, and we talked about the senses. All of these things Allah has given to us. They are great benefits from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are benefits that will benefit us in this world and definitely in the akhirah. Right, so this is very, very important to bear in mind as well. And one of the benefits which I want to talk about today is time. What? Yeah, Allah has given you time, which is a great benefit. Some, some of you will live 60 years. Some of you will live, live 30 years. Some of you will live less than that. But the point is not the length of time. It's not how long you live. It's what you do with the time that you have. And you'll see from the, some of the ulama and the people that I will talk about that they lived relatively short lives, but they were able to achieve a lot. In the story of Nuh alayhi salatu salam, 950 years da'wah. But how many people accepted the message of Nuh alayhi salatu salam? So it's not about a length of life. Of course, we ask Allah to give us a long life wherein we can worship Him. Uh, water here, we should ask for this. But at the same time, some people will live long, long lives, but they will waste their lives in ghaflat. Some people, Allah will give them so much money, so much wealth, but they will refuse to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allahu alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal-ard. Allah created the heavens and the earth. Allah is the one who created the heavens and the earth. Wa anzala min as-samai ma'a. And he sends from the heavens water. فَأَخْرَجَ بِهِ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ رِزْقًا لَكُمْ And through it, plants grow, sustenance grow, رِزْقًا لَكُمْ For you, that rice that you will have today, that food that you will have today, it grew out of the ground. It came from somewhere. Allah nourished it. It's sitting on your plate, but Allah nourished it. So رِزْقًا لَكُمْ And it says, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الْفُلْكَ لِتَذْرِيَ فِي الْبَحْرِ بِأَمْرِ Allah says, I've made the ship which courses along the ocean with the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah talks about all of these, but Allah also talks about the sun and the moon. That I've created the sun and the moon and they follow their path. The moon follows, a me- it's almost like a mechanical path. It has a path that the moon follows around our planet. Our planet moves around the sun, right? It moves around the sun in a predestined path. All the other planets, you'll notice, if you ever look at the stars, you'll notice over the year they move in a certain way. It's perfect. So Allah says, I've created this for you as well. And you, when you look at this, you think, wow, how does this happen? And how does Jupiter do this? How does Mercury do this? How does Mars do this? And now you can even see some of the planets because of the sky the moon. So this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he has given us day and he has given us night. Day is to worship him, to seek his sustenance, to seek his pleasure. And night is to rest, to give our body rest as well. If we never had night time, right? Only Allah knows what we would be like. If we had never had daylight, what would happen? So Allah has created night and day and they alternate. This is from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot even change the maghrib time by a minute. The time the sun is going to set, Allah's written is going to set at that time. Except when Allah wills. We cannot even change the course of the movement of the sun. When it's going to rise, it will rise. When the moon is going to come, it's going to come. Allah has control over all these affairs and we are completely powerless. If Allah wished, He would make it eternal darkness. The sun would never rise and we would die. We wouldn't exist. Nothing would grow. We would die. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, don't you look at all of this? So it's worth reflecting upon all of these things. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also in the Quran, many, many times, He vows by time. Allah makes a qasr by time. Why would Allah make a qasam? To tell you this is something important. When you make qasam by something, when you make a vow by something, when you make a promise of something, Allah, it's telling you that that's important. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before I go to into some examples, what I will do, I'll give you some examples of people of the past, a few examples, and then I will give you some practical steps, maybe inshallah, that you can take as well. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ni'matani. مغبون فيهما كثير من الناس رسول الله عليه وسلم is reported of said there are two نعمات two particular نعمات that people are uh, wasting wasting they're not careful about they don't do قدر of it two نعمات in particular الصحة والفراغ health Allah has given you health and Allah has given you free time. He said, these two things people don't value. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa is an authentic hadith. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said. That people have wealth, but they waste it. People have free time. Uh, instead of coming, becoming better human beings and using it wisely, they waste their free time. They're on YouTube, watching movies relentlessly. They're on this thing, that thing. And they're not valuing their time. Hmm? So this Rasulullah has told us about these two things and we see it today when people get old but you know when I was strong I never spent my time worshipping Allah when I had the youthful strength I wasted it right when I had free time I wasn't working I didn't have children I didn't have commitments then I didn't value time now you have children it's difficult to get free time yeah, so you have to steal time almost so Rasulullah spoke the truth Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim Jawzi Rahimahullah in one of his kitabs called Al Jawab Al Kafi Liman Sa'ala An Andawa Shafi. This is the name of the kitab. I'm just giving you reference to this. He says, The highest, most noblest, and most beneficial of thoughts are those that are for Allah and the hereafter. Even when you're sitting there, you're sitting there and you're doing fikr, you're thinking in your mind and in your heart. He says, The best thing to do is think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not doing anything, there's no haraka. There's no movement, licking the person is thinking about Allah. He says, this is the best thing a person can do. 
Even that's using your time wisely. What is for Allah is many types. Uh, and one of them is to think about the obligation and using time and to use time in such a way to think about how I can use my time effectively. This is a form of ibadah. When a person sits down and says, you know what, how will I spend my time? How will I use my time? How will I make qadr of my time? He said, this is also a good use of your time as well. Okay, you have to be conscious of your time. Don't waste your time and neither waste time of other people. Some of the ulama and mashayikh will come across them. They used to hate it, literally when people waste their time. Coming to them and just asking them questions which aren't necessary, which aren't important, spending time and time with them. Understanding that people who are busy have time, which is should be used for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was narrated by Amir ibn Abi Qais, who was a very famous tabi'in, that a man came to him and said, Shaykh, I want to talk to you. Tabi'in ta, someone came to him, Amir ibn Abi Qais. So I said, someone came to him, he was a tabi'in. Someone came to him and said, Shaykh, I want to talk to you. We just want to have a catch up. Let's have a bit of a chit chat. Let's have a natter. So he says to him, You know the sun? He says, Yes, Shaykh. Can you see it? He said, Gee. He said, Can you take hold of the sun and hold the sun for me? So let's go pakarlo. Grab the sun. So he said, How can I stop the sun? How can I grab the sun? What was the meaning of it? That can you hold time for me? Can you stop time? Because the sun is how the time is calculated. So if you can hold the sun, you can stop time. Literally. So he said, stop the sun for me. Because if you can stop the sun, then you can hold time and then we can have a conversation. And then once we finish talking, then you can let go of the sun and we can, I don't lose any of my time. Does, does everyone understand the meaning here that the Sheikh is trying to impart? So the time is ever moving. The Sheikh is basically saying that time won't stop. Yes, of course, it is zaruriyat. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying that, you know, you don't go to Mufti Sahib or Maulana to ask questions. If you have a question and you need clarification, that's also ibadat. If you have a question, a dini question, whatever ho, whatever needs you have, then that's also a form of ibadat. But what I'm saying is that we don't waste time. Right? It's, it's something that we're never going to get back. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala says, he was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He says, I have never regretted anything so much as my regret over a day in which the sun sets and my lifespan decreases and my good deeds have not increased. The sun has set, my life is getting shorter, but my a'mal haven't increased. This is compiled by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud saying this. Then look at the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, Imam Abu Yusuf, Imam Abu Yusuf, Qadi Abu Yusuf, was one of his names, Yaqub ibn Ibrahim al Ansari al Kufi, later known as al Baghdadi. Uh, he was a companion, he was a student of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, right? And he was responsible for spreading the madhab and the knowledge of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, wide and far, very, very far places. And he was also a judge for many Abbasid rulers. Allah gave him such ilm and such power and such ru'ab that he was also a state judge of the Abbasid Khalifate. And he was also known as the Supreme Judge. Yeah, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah. But yet we see him, they call, on his deathbed. He's about to die. When a person is about to die, they think about, you know, wasiya, inheritance and these other things. During the last moments of his life, Imam Abu Yusuf Rahimahullah, the top student, one of the top students of Imam uh, Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah, he's about to die and what does he talk about? He's talking about fiqh. Masla Masail. Mouth kid walked. At the time of dying, he's discussing Masla Masail. Right? So his student comes to him. His student's name was Qadi Ibrahim Ibn al Jarrah al Kufi al Misri. His name was also Misri because he moved to Egypt later on. He says himself, I'll, I'll narrate this to you. He says, I went to see Imam Abu Yusuf Rahimahullah and I found him unconscious. I found him unconscious. So when he came back to consciousness, I asked him, Sheikh, that uh, how are you? And the Sheikh just replied straight away. He said, Oh, Ibrahim, the Sheikh on the deathbed, he's saying to his student, Oh, Ibrahim, what is your opinion on this fula mas'ala? What is your opinion on this mas'ala? I said, Sheikh, you're, about, you're in this state and you're asking about masail. You're asking about masail. He said, no, no, let's discuss this. I need to know, I need to discuss this masala because somebody must have come to Imam Abu Yusuf and asked him the question and it must have been bothering him that I need to get to the answer to this. So he said, what's the question? The question was this basically that, uh, Oh Ibrahim, um, 
Which is better? When you go for Hajj, if you're doing for Hajj, you know when you have to throw the sh- stones on the shaitan. He asked him the question that should you do this when you're in Hajj? Should you do this riding an animal or should you do it walking? Should you ride, if you're on a horse or, an, or a donkey or a camel, should you throw it, should you do it from there or should you get off the animal and should you be walking and do it? So anyway, the discussion took place and then he gave the answer and then he said, when I left him, when I left Imam Abu, Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah, I heard a scream and I realized that Imam Yusuf had passed away, rahimahullah. And if you look in the books of fiqh, many, many traditions of Ras- uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, has reached us through the isnad of Imam Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah. We are indebted to people like this. But look at their deathbeds. Even at the time of death, what are they talking about? Muslim Masai. They're making fiqh for the ummah. That somebody will have this question, somebody will know the need to know an answer to this. So let me try and answer this for them. This is why ulama, these ulama are very pious people. We are indebted to their mujahida. In fact, let me tell you something else about Imam Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah. His son, he had many sons, but one of his sons passed away. He was told by his son that had passed away. Oh, let me tell you something else about him, by the way. We are told that he stayed with Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, for 17 years in his suhbah. 17 years Imam Abu Yusuf rahimahullah was in the suhbah of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. When you keep suhbah for that long, you're bound to become Qadi Imam Abu Yusuf, the great Imam Abu Yusuf. Huh? So this is why in our tradition, the suhbah of our mashaykh and our ulama is very, very important. And it says that he never missed Zuhr prayer with his sheikh. He was always beside his sheikh in Zuhr prayer as well, right? except when he was ill. Muhammad ibn Qudama narrates, that Shuja'a ibn Makhlad once heard Imam Abu Yusuf rahimahullah say, listen to this, Imam Abu Yusuf says that once my son died, my son died. So I didn't attend to his uh, janazah, I didn't go to his janazah, I didn't go to wash him, his body. And I said to my neighbors and my relatives, you take charge of that, Akallu, you do this, you do this janazah, kafan dafan, you do all of that, right? Because I don't want to miss the dust of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Huh? And if I do miss a dars, I might miss some important masail. I might miss something which I will never get afterwards. Subhanallah. This is the qurbani that they made and this is the value of time that they had as well. Uh, in fact, it's also mentioned about another shaykh, Dawood al-Ta'i, rahimahullah, that he used to eat uh, bread, bread crumbs. You know bread crumbs? The bits that fall off the bread that nobody really wants to eat. He said he used to say this and he said the difference. People say, why are you doing this shaykh for shaykh? He said, Sheikh, the difference between eating the crumbs and chewing bread, and if you make bread, fark, usme, he said, this, you can pray 50 verses in this. Pachas ayate. You can pray 50 verses in that time. This is the value. You know, we would say these people are crazy. We would say, Layla Majnun, well, we like, these people are crazy. Like, this is how much they value their time. Uh, so it's very, very important that we value our time as well. Uh, and so, in this month, and also because of coronavirus, COVID-19, many of us will get time home alone. We're no longer mixing with people as much. And many ulama have written books on this. Imam Ghazali has an entire kitab on this. And many mashayikh have written about the virtues of seclusion, khalwa. Uh, many ulama have written this. In many traditions, you'll find this idea of being away from people, spending time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the early days, just before he became a prophet, spent time in the cave. Why with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, many of our mashaykh would do this as well. Many anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, would do this as well. Keeping distance from society for a while, not for permanent. By the way, hamara deen mein, it's not allowed to have complete detachment from the dunya. Complete detachment from society. La rahbani yata fil islam. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, reported to have said, that there's no monasticism. You know how some in some religious traditions, they don't even get married. They don't even have relationship with people. They keep themselves completely detached from society. This is not Islam. In Islam, we are people of moderation. We have to work. We have to have children. We have to get married and so forth and so on. So spending time alone is a great benefit, a great boon. Our mashayikh during the month of Ramadan would shut down from everything else and would keep time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the beginning of his nubuwa was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came with him with the first revelation of the Quran and towards the end of his life Allah also reminds him in in the Quran towards the end Allah mentions in the Quran إِذَا جَاءَ نَسُوا اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا 
فَصَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابَ And Abu Bakr understood that this was signaling the end of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's worldly life. And so we value our time. So we've got time alone, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing. Spending time doing zikr, lifting your hands up, praying Quran, making dua, making istighfar is very, very important. But how does a person also value their, their life and make most of their time? Number two. So number one is having khalwat, having time alone is also very, very useful in this time. Number two is very, very important. You have to have determination. It's very easy to become lazy. It's very easy to sleep an extra half an hour. It's very easy to go sleep late. Make yourself a tartib, timetable, the iswaqt. Make kitab parunga. It's what I'll be studying. At this time, I'm going to be sitting with the mashaykh. At this time, I'll be spending time with my family. Have a routine. Maulana Ashraf Ali Tanwi, rahimahullah. If you look at his, uh, his regime, Maulana Abdul Majid Dariyabari, rahimahullah, he mentions this when he talks about Hazrat Tanwi, rahimahullah. It's a very long uh, um, biography of Hazrat Tanwi. Maulana Abdul Majid Dariyabari, rahimahullah, by the way, he was a person who at one stage in his life became a murtad. He left Islam. He left Islam and he went into philosophy and all of these things. He became what's called a secular atheist. But it was through his correspondence with Hazrat Tanwi, rahimahullah, he became, he, he came back to Islam and he became an ashik of Hazrat Tanwi, rahimahullah. And he said, you know, this person, when I met him, in fact, he says in his, in his book that when I met Hazrat Tanwi, rahimahullah, and I sat in his sohbah, I felt like, you know how Christopher Columbus found America? I felt like that. He says that in his book. When he talked about Hazrat Tanwi, rahimahullah, it's like when I found Hazrat Tanwi, rahimahullah, it's like a, it's like when Christopher Columbus found America. I like it is ikhtilaf in really that did, did Christopher Columbus really found find America? What the orbat here? But the point I'm making is that these mashaykh was so powerful, their ru'ab and their fez was such that it had an effect upon people. So having this routine, Hazrat Tanwi had a very strict routine. In fact, in, in his books, he's mentioned. That you do salam to him once and after that you don't talk to Hazrat Tanwi anymore when you're at the Khanka unless he talks to you. You just, you just follow what Hazrat Tanwi tells you to do. And if you do that, you'll be successful. Anyway, this was Hazrat Tanwi in Tanaba 1, Rahimahullah. So having determination, what's my maqsad in life? What's my purpose in life? Why do I even exist? Right? And so having this idea of determination, may you karunga, I'm going to reach this level. I'm going to perform ibadah. I'm going to read so many books. I'm going to write so much. Having focus. Right? What's my purpose? When a person has a purpose in life, then you see that they focus. Even by dunyavi terms, you look at non-Muslims, successful non-Muslims, you'll notice that they're very focused. Very focused. When I went to Barbados many, many years ago, I was reading a biography of the person who owns the airline, uh, Virgin, Virgin Airlines. So I, I decided to read this book. I read the entire book on the eight-hour flight there. So one of the things I was reading, I like he's not a Muslim. When I was reading about his, his story, his qissa, one of the things that stood out about him was he was very focused. You know, like he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to set up a, I mean, he had like a drinks business, then he had like um, a music business, and then he had this airline business, and then he had this train business for a while, right? So all these things, because he was very focused. And you look at many people like that. They were very focused. They know what they want to do. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very focused. Tawheed risal at tabliq. Ta'aleem tasawwuf. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam focused on. Then you look at the Sahaba, they were very focused on what they wanted to do. They never wasted time. Tabi'in, Tabi Tabi'in, and some of the people that we've talked about, they were very focused. You look at our Mashaykh, very focused. Whether that was in Deoband, whether that was in uh, Tanababan, whether that was in Sahrampur, wherever it was, in their writing, in their engagement, in their work, they were focused. They knew what they had to do. And when our elders came to this country, they knew what they had to do. May Allah bless all of them. So having focus is really important, right? What is it that you need to do? Never mind what everybody else says. And when you have focus, when people say things about you, it doesn't matter. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can there be anyone in human history who was taunted, who was insulted, who was hurt as much as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Sira program that we're doing? Uh, we look at the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they spat at him, they tried to kill him, assassinate him. They killed his fellow family members. Divorces were taking place with his own daughters. Right? So much harm was then taken to Prophet Sallallahu They would mock him. He was in sajda and they would put the carcass of a camel, a dead camel on the back of the Prophet Sallallahu Fatima at the age of four or five, the ulama tell us, she would come and you know, move this from the back of the Prophet Sallallahu So much difficulty they gave to him. But he made dua for them. 
and he continued giving da'wah. He focused on the mission. He never got distracted by what the kuffar of Quraysh were doing to him. He focused on the mission. And because he focused on the mission, focus on the mission, Islam has reached all four corners today. So remain focused. And you look at our own Akabah, they follow this way of the Prophet What's my maqsad? They don't get distracted in anything else. And then when you see them, you know that this person is focused. And different ulama, different people will have different focuses. Some ulama, mashallah, they're very good at giving lectures. Allah give them jazakhir. Some ulama are very good at public uh, writing and din bifa in various places. Allah has given everybody, even yourself, Allah has given everybody different strengths. Allah has given you money, use it to do serve the deen. Allah has given you good contacts. Some people, mashallah, you know, you have them in a community. Where they say, they know everybody. And they know how to get on with everybody. Yeah, Allah has given you a strength. Use it to benefit the community. Some people, Allah gives them physical strength. You know, they build a masjid or they build things. That's your strength. You might not have much knowledge. It doesn't matter. Allah will take work from you. All the Sahaba, if you look at their lives, you notice that they were all different. But what united them was their love for Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some were warriors, some were scholars, some were scribes, some were just Zuhd, practicing Zuhd. They just went into Zuhd and Ibadat. Some were Fuqaha. Everybody was different. So using your strength for the better of deen. So look at yourself. This is why Hazrat uh, Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi, Rahimahullah, in his uh, Ma'rif al-Masnawi, the first line he says, yeah, Usul, Usul, Usul al-Deen. If you read his Masnawi, if you get time to read it, it's in Farsi, but it's translated as well. Hazrat Tanwi has also written a, a commentary on it, the Khalid Masnavi, Rahimahullah. He says, look within yourself and ask yourself, who am I? What do I need to do? What do I need to do to get to where I need to get to? So solitude is important. Determination and self-discipline. Too many of our people waste their time. Self-discipline. Right? For two hours, I'm going to read the Kitab. For two hours, I'm going to pray Quran. For 20 minutes, I'm going to do this every day. And little by little, you see the effect of it. Nobody is asking us to worship Allah all night and then be tired all day. No, joke or sector, do it with istiqamah. The most beloved action in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that you have istiqamah upon, even if it's little. If you can just pray Fajr and Zuhr, for example, at the masjid. You can't come for the masajid, but you're able to do that every day. Inshallah, Allah will give you barakah in that. Right? If you're able to do little things, small, small things, but you're able to do it with istiqamah. You pray Quran every day. It's only five minutes. Five minutes, bus. But you know what, Mawlana? I'm able to do it every day. I'm able to do it every day. And then that's istiqamah. Huh? I can only pray sunnats after namaz. Sometimes I might even struggle to pray sunnats. I can only pray the first. But you're able to do that every day. Allah will give you success in that. So everybody is different. So having self-discipline is very, very important. But look, this is what you need to do. And the next one is ambition. You need to have ambition. Have ulu wa himmat. Don't be startled. Don't be weak. Don't be scared of anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was digging in the khandak in Madinah al-Munawwara, the kuffar are coming to destroy the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his community. They are facing death. And Rasulullah is digging in the conduct because there was a rock there that wouldn't move. I just, you must have heard this story, right? And the Prophet is like, he gets the yaks and he gets the stone and he's hitting the stone. And what does he tell him? Look, these are, this is a community which is small. They're living in a desert of Medina, in a small village. And Rasulullah is telling them that a time will come where you will have Persia will become yours, Syria will become yours, Yemen will become yours. And it's like a small group of believers. But Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving them ulu wa himmat. That day, hum kaam karenge, jo bhi ho. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa says one hadith, what, what does he say? That even when Israfil is about to blow the trumpet, plant a seed. Give charity. Even if Qiyamah is about to come, because we're not fatalists. We don't give up. We carry on going. So you need to have ambition. That you know, this is what I want to do. do. I want to make Masjid al-Bilal. Allah make it such. The best masjid in the whole of the UK. The ibadat is taking place and all of Allah's uh, worshippers are coming here, here and our children, our youngsters become the next, tomorrow's leaders, our ulama and our mashayikh. We have the best madrasa and our ta'aleem and tarbiyat is the best. Uh, we have this ulu, we have koshish karenge. Even if it doesn't happen, even if it doesn't happen, Allah will give you the ajr for it. Why? Because aapki ummeet thi na. You had ummeet for it. Uh, even if it doesn't happen. So many times, so many ulama you read that in their lifetime, they weren't very successful. 
But after they passed away, they left the legacy behind. Look at Tabligh Jamal, for example. Who would have thought Tabligh Jamal would have become the largest revivalist movement in the world? It is. By definition, it is. Even in academia, I'm telling you this, it's the largest movement in the world. And despite whatever people say about it, but I'm telling you this. Who would have thought that when um, Maulana Qasim Nanotwi, Rahimahullah, Maulana Rashid Ahmad Gangoi, Rahimahullah, when they sat in Dioban after uh, the 1857 mutiny, that they would have generated the greatest expanse of madrasas in the world, spread all over the world. That in 1857, that in Blackburn there would be a Darul Ulum, in Barry, Manchester, Leicester and so forth. Who would have thought this? Huh? But they made the effort, they had a fikr and a concern. When Imam Ghazali, when he was writing his book, who would have thought that his book would have reached all over the globe? You had to even non-Muslims were benefiting from his book. His books are being researched and looked at. Uh, so this is the effort that we need to do, that Allah will take work from us. That we just make the effort. Maybe tomorrow, Masjid Bilal, when you've left this world, that Allah will create such ulama that they will become the leaders of the ummah. Imagine how much reward you will get. So having determination, having ambition is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants of us. It's mentioned about Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi. I mentioned about him before. I mean, these people were thinking years ahead. You know, Imam Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi would sharpen his pencil. Uh, does anyone do this today? He's sharpening his pencil and draw you know, the wood that's coming off the pencil. He would collect it all. He would collect it all. And he said, he said that and he would use the pencil to write hadith. So he would collect all the wood shavings of the pencil. And it became such a large amount that he said that, you know, when you need to wash my body and you need to heat the water eh, to wash his body, when you can burn that pencil shavings, all of the pencil shavings. And he said it was sufficient for him. It was, it was enough pencil shavings to burn his, to burn, to, to burn, to heat the water so we could wash his body. Rahimahullah. So this is something to bear in mind. And then people say, Maulana, we don't, we're not like this. Eh, but Allah can give you so much barakah in your life. A very famous scholar of the Indian subcontinent, Abdul Hayy al Laknawi, Rahimahullah, very famous alim of the Hanafi school as well. He died at the age of 39. Very young age. Many people don't know this. He died at a very young age, only 100 years ago. He only died like 100 years ago. So he's not like an old scholar. He's a senior scholar, like a, a modern scholar, if you like. He died at the age of 39, but the books he's left behind. He's left 110 books behind. 110 books people are benefiting from even today. Even I've read some of his books and I think, mashallah, you know, at the age of 39, how, how could he have done this? He wrote 110 books and he, they weren't the simple books. They were very complete. Some of the books that he's written, you could tell that they need a lot of time and effort to write. A lot of effort. But he was able to do it. Rahimahullah. So look at this. As the time we have mentioned him before, the Sheikh of India, right? Uh, the sage of the Ummah. His, his collection of books, uh, he died around uh, 40 years ago or so, maybe a little bit long, more than that. And he has written over a thousand books. There isn't a topic that you can think of which Hazrat Tanwi hasn't written about. Right? There isn't a topic that you can think of that Hazrat Tanwi rahimahullah, hasn't written about. Right? And people are still writing his books. I, I'm, I'm reading a PhD at the moment. Someone wrote a PhD on Hazrat Tanwi rahimahullah, in America, a Muslim. 2015, he published a PhD. I'm reading at the moment. And he, he's, he's analyzing and looking at the life of Hazrat Tanwi. There's been books now being published in English in, in the West about Hazrat Tanwi. So it's only his works are now becoming more known in a wider community as well. So this is very, very important as well. What I would say, and I'm going to conclude now is, look at your life, look at your tartib, look at how, how, what your commitments you have and fix like time. I know one of my students, mashallah, in the evening he has, a long, he has a long job. He works as a delivery driver. He works early morning and then he comes home and he goes to sleep and he, then he teaches his children in the evening. What he does, he tells me, from 9 till 10 or 10 till 11, I can't remember the exact time, he, he, he used to live in our area, he would study Arabic online and sometimes with me as well. And he did this every night, just for one hour, every night, every night. And now his Arabic is so strong that people go to him for help. And he teaches other people, <clears throat> one hour every day. But he made this effort, <clears throat> he had this determination that Morana, <clears throat> I want to learn Arabic. I want to learn Arabic. And he made the effort, determination that he had. So looking at your life and saying, look, this time is for children. This time is with the wife because it's important. This time I need to go work. This time I need to rest. This time I need to do this. But this time I'm going to fix for ibadah. This time I'm going to sit with Maulana so-and-so, Mufti so-and-so, and I'm going to learn something with him. So this is very, very important to bear in mind as well. And having that focus, when we have that focus, inshallah, we will be successful. And we need to finally know this. 
And I'll end with this because there's lots of things that can be said. A practical thing. I say this to everybody and I say this to myself first and foremost. You cannot do everything you think for, for the Ummah. Right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done in the Ummah. There's so much work that needs to be done. If you try and do too much, you spread yourself thin. You don't master anything and you end up just having too much on, too many phone calls, too many WhatsApp messages, too many WhatsApp groups. Nothing actually gets done. Find something that you know is important to you. Find something that you know that you can do something well. And then say to yourself, this is what I'm going to focus on. If anybody else comes to me with, this, with this, these other ideas, because I'm focused on this, I'm not going to be able to help them. I'm not going to turn them away, but I'm going to pass them on to other people. So for example, someone rang me today and they had a marriage issue. So they need counseling. Now I know that counseling is a mustaqil field. I mean, I can give some advice, but it's a mustaqil field. So I said to them, Bhai, I'll give you the number for so-and-so, because I know it takes a lot of time as well. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy. I said, look, Bhai, I, I'm, I'm in a field of writing and researching. And if I spend four hours with this, then I'm going to lose my four hours, which is the field that I'm in. So what we need to do, and sometimes we need to learn to say no to people as well. That, Bhai, ye mera kaam hai. I'm not into politics. Hazrat Taimi Rahimahullah was into the Sawuf, for example, and writing. He didn't get involved in politics in India. He stayed away from that. He stayed aloof from that. But he was successful at what he did. Right? And you can't fault him for that. So we focus on what we are good at. What am I good at? What's my strength? Other things you leave to other people. But yeah, this is not for me. I wish I could help you. I'll try and push you onto somebody else because I'm working in this field. And if you're able to do that, you're able to become successful. You master.